Uh, we're gonna continue a little bit today with the third session of morality, so a little bit more, but we are going to put this aside after today and maybe come back to this a little bit later. But we are devoting a lot to morality because it is important for what it is that we're doing in this semester. Do you remember a little bit of what happened last week? What did we do last week? Trolley problems, right. What, what's your takeaway from that? What do you remember as the ending note? Yeah, so we saw a trolley dilemma in real life and we saw a participant who went through something very meaningful, maybe traumatic, right? And then I said that I also worry about you taking part in this course and us debating these, these sort of things. Um, so that is important. And today I want to show you why this is important. So I mentioned this very, very briefly. It seems like trolley dilemmas are something very hypothetical, right? So there's a trolley, run away, it's about to hit. Like, what are the odds of us having to really think about this in real life? But it turns out that there are real implications for this today that we need to consider. So, um, so there is the course summary that you're welcome to contribute to. Lots of benefits for that. There is the Open Science Framework Public. There are syllabus if you haven't looked at that yet. And now we're going to talk about moral machines. So we're at a very unique point in time where all the stuff that we thought is hypothetical with trolley dilemmas is actually becoming very important. Um, we knew that social psychologists are important, but now they're really important because we need to work together with other people, technology people, to make sure that our technology is in line with uh, trolley-related philosophical, social, psychological dilemmas. Uh, moral machines. So this paper came out in 2018. This, in my mind, is one of the most important social psychology papers to ever be published. It started an entire domain but it also shows us, inspires us of how to do social psychological studies. So when I run a study, when I ran this with HKU students, when I see what's published out there, we run a sample in participant pool at HKU online, 200, 500, 1000. Our biggest one is 2,500. This is like the largest sample that we get. But there's lots of problems with that because we choose a specific sample that has a speci specific demographic. So it could be in the US or in Hong Kong. It could be students or it could be online workers. It's very, very limited. But what happens when you move from that place to a different place and then run this in a different culture with a different sample with different demographics? What happens? So somebody decided to do the trolley dilemmas solving all trolley dilemmas that have ever been invented and will ever be invented in every possible sample. And you can only do that with technology. So they built a website called Moral Machines, where they invite you to create whatever version of trolley dilemma that you want. And other people will participate in your trolley dilemma that you created. So we'll do a little bit of that. But first, I'll show you a video of what it is that they've done. Who would you save? The pedestrian in the road? Or the drivers in the car? It's not easy. And yet that's the kind of decision which millions of autonomous cars would have to make in the near future. We program the machine, but who do we tell it to save? That is the setup of the moral machine experiment. There are so many uh, moral decisions that we usually make uh, during the day, we don't realize. In driverless cars, uh, these decisions will have to be implemented ahead of time. The goal was to, uh, to open this discussion to the public. Some decisions might seem simple. Should the car save a family of four or a cat? But what about a homeless person and their dog instead of a businessman? Or how about two athletes and an old woman instead of two school children? The problem was that there were so many combinations, 
so many, so many possible accidents that it seemed impossible to investigate them all uh, using classic social science methods. Not only that, but how do people's culture and background affect the decisions that they make? The only option we had really was to turn it into a viral website. Of course, it's easier said than done, right? But that is exactly what the team managed to do. They turned these situations into an online task that people across the globe wanted to share and take part in. They gathered almost 40 million moral decisions taken from millions of online participants across 233 countries and territories from all around the world. The results are intriguing. First, there are three fundamental principles which hold true across the world. The main results of the paper for me are first uh, the big three in people's preferences, which is save human, save the greater number, save the kids. And the second most interesting finding was the, the, the clusters, the, the clusters of countries with different moral profiles. The first cluster uh, included many Western countries. Uh, the second cluster had many uh, Eastern countries. And the third cluster had countries from uh, Latin America and also from former uh, French colonies. The, the cultural difference we find are, are sometimes hard to describe because they're multidimensional, but some of them are very striking, like uh, the fact that Eastern countries do not have such a strong preference for saving young lives. Uh, Eastern countries seem to be more respectful of older people, which I thought was a, a very interesting finding. And it wasn't just age. One cluster showed an unexpectedly strong preference for saving women over men. I was also struck by the fact that French and the, su and the French subcluster was so interested in saving women. That was, yeah, that, I, I'm still not quite sure what's going on here. Another surprising finding concerned people's social status. Uh, on one side, we put uh, uh, male and female executives, and other side, we put a homeless person. The higher the economic inequality in a country, the more people were willing to spare the uh, executives at the cost of the homeless people. This work provides new insight into how morals change across cultures and the team see particular relevance to the field of artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles. In the grand scheme of it, uh, I think these results are going to be very important to uh, align artificial, artificial intelligence to human values. Uh, we sometimes change our mind. Uh, other people next to us don't think the same thing we do. Other countries don't think the same things we do. So aligning AI and human moral value uh, is only possible if we do understand these differences, and that's what we try to do. I so much hope that we can converge, that we avoid a future where uh, you have to uh, learn about the new ethical setting of your car every time you cross a border. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about. Let's imagine a society not too far away, could be in a decade. Some people already expected this to happen now. Yeah, so we can, we can imagine a situation uh, where we have uh, self-driving autonomous vehicles. And then when we go into sit in the self-driving autonomous vehicles, we want to know what kind of decisions are going to be made by that uh, car, right? So do we want the Tesla engineers, the Google engineers, whoever is programming that car to make those moral decisions for us? Do we want to be in charge when we buy a car, a self-driving autonomous vehicle? Do we want to program the car? I don't know how we would do that, but maybe we take what's on that website and put this in the car. And then when you purchase a new car, you sit there for half a day solving moral, moral dilemmas on the trolley dilemma. And then this is how the car will behave. What's that? Open source, why? Will it save you? Yeah, so it's a, another interesting question that you raise is that uh, let's say that the morally, I don't know if this is the case, but let's say that the morally good thing is to, uh, if it's, there's the debate between you sitting in the car getting killed or 20 other people dying, 
and the car makes a decision that it's going to kill you as the driver, as the person in the car, who is going to buy that car? Will people buy a car that has programmatic open source <laughs> decision to kill you instead of kill others? Will people consciously, deliberately make a decision to buy that car? And we really need to ask ourselves, who do we want to make that decision? Who do you want to make this decision? Car company, the government, social psychologist, do you want to make this decision? So you're asking, is it always going to be a mixed car? Uh, like having the ability to both have an AI and a person in charge? That's what you're saying? So, so what is your statement about this or a question? Yeah. So, so you see this as a long-term vision. This is what you would prefer. Yeah. So this, is, this raises a good point. I'm actually curious about this. It's good that you raised this. Who would you rather make decisions about morality? Would you rather that each individual does their own kind of moral decision-making? Or would you prefer that we make one decision for our society and then that is implemented in all the self-driving autonomous vehicles? Do you prefer people to be in charge? Or do you prefer technology to be in charge? How many of you think they would like people to be in charge? Some of you, yeah? How about technology, self-driving autonomous vehicles? None of you? What, what is the logic, can I ask you? What, what's your logic? So if I understand it correctly, it's about accountability and responsibility. You want to be able to hold somebody accountable for this. Yes. So and you're saying if it's humans, they've made a the decision, we know who to blame, but we don't know who to blame if it's a self-driving autonomous vehicle. I mean, it's when they buy a self drive to public autonomous vehicle, they mm. have to agree and to pay all the prices of that, which includes when the technology doesn't make a mistake. Mm -hmm. I understand. You know, nowadays it's not so common in Hong Kong. I don't know how many of you drive, but let's say when you travel or let's say when you do have the opportunity to drive, how many of you still rely on your own mapping mechanism? Look at old maps and navigate through that. And how many of you use the Google Waze, whatever? So about a decade, two decades ago, we couldn't imagine relying, relaying all of our decisions to that app to make all that for us. Uh, but nowadays we let the car dictate, uh, or in this case, the mobile phone dictate for us how to drive. We're still to some extent in control, usually to make mistakes. <laughs> So if we do deviate, it usually leads to us uh, making worse decisions. But I think all of us have realized over time that Google and Waze uh, are doing a better job than, than we do. It's not about morality, though. It's about efficiency of us getting to the point where we need to be. But we need to ask ourselves, which one do we prefer? And it's not only about our own preferences when we buy a car, but do we want the other drivers who are maybe tired, maybe had a drink, maybe on their mobiles, maybe distracted, maybe having all sorts of issues? Do we want them to be in control when they're driving? Or do we want something that's efficient that we all decided together on its morality to make that kind of decision? So I understand your inclination to want a person Honestly, I'm very hesitant myself because I know weaknesses. I know weaknesses in myself, first of all. I know when I'm tired. I know that I'm not always paying attention 100% all the time. You know, I listen to podcasts. I listen to audiobooks when I'm driving, especially long drives, and I get distracted. Sometimes we do everything automatically, but we're not as efficient as a self-driving autonomous vehicles, and sometimes we don't pay attention to things um, plus, we make all sorts of moral decisions that I think a car is better equipped than us to, to make. Uh, first of all, we kind of cut corners. So we see a speed limit of 60, but we say, oh, 65, it's okay. Because in our mind, the police would not care 10%. Maybe I can go over. Or now I'm really in a rush, so I need to get to class, and class is starting. So what should I do? I'll speed a little bit. Nobody will catch me. So we make all these kinds of decisions, which perhaps we don't want others to make when they're driving the car. So self-driving autonomous vehicle might help solve that. But it is something to ponder because we're getting into that situation. 
What do you think the role is for us as scientists to contribute to this? What can we give to society? What can we give to technology? What should we do? What part should we take? What are the big insights that we can gain from that research? Back then, I think the video was in 2019, 40 million. Now it's hundreds of millions of people participating, every possible. So it's, a, it's a data set. People can go, can look, and see the preferences. What can we gain from this? This is a nice trick, but how is this related to real life? So you're saying, first of all, notice and understand that there are biases, that there are cultural differences between different places. And that maybe we have a role to play in equalizing things and making things more equitable, more equal, to ensure that there are no biases in implementations of these things, right? These three. So what can we do? What kind of research can we... How does this contribute to what you just said? Hard, yeah. It's difficult, right? Any other thoughts you want to contribute? Yeah, yeah. Good, good questions, good, good issues to raise. So we have, first of all, like this dilemma of, do we want to have cultural differences in implementation? So one of the first points that you made is that perhaps the car should allow for different preferences, moral preferences when you go in different places in the world. Uh, and I think he already discusses the issue of, do we really want to, uh, every time we cross the border, I travel quite a bit, so every time I rent a car, do I need to sit down and think what are the moral implications of the car that I'm renting? It's going to be a, a mess, right? Does uh, the country that I'm going into belong to this cluster or belongs to that cluster? Plus, we already can see all sorts of things that are, uh, you know, we should debate as a society. Let's say the, prefer the thing that he was surprised about, preference for women, right? Do we want this as a society? Do we want this to be more equal? Do we want to... Um, you know, take that biases and implement them as the morality for cars that are in that place? Or do we want as a society co to correct some of those? You can imagine the opposite. Let's say that you saw a strong preference for men, right? Immediately people are like, oh, no, of course not. Preference for white over black, because this is what most people say, let's say in some country. Of course, you would rage about this. When we see, oh, women over men, maybe there's a justification for that because, you know, there's been a bias against them. But any kind of bias, if you just flip it the other way, it makes you realize that there is an issue. The question is, do we want to implement this based on what people tell us that they prefer? Or should we take a step back, ask moral philosophers, ask social psychologists, so do something that's different than what is happening in actual society? And who gets to, to decide? So. This is a hot area for you to come in and do research on, not just in academia. Actually, when you graduate, having finished this course, or in psychology, sometimes you ask yourself, as a social psychology, what kind of job can I get? This is the kind of job that you can get because there's a lot of demand for this. Let's have a quick look at what it looks like. I think it's uh, worthwhile to play around with this first because it's uh, interesting they have interfaces in i think a lot of uh, common common uh, languages but also if you end up in industry and doing some stuff, stuff that's related to this is how you can design an ultimate study to me this is very close to an ultimate social psychology study so you have different languages we'll do english and then you can browse the different uh, trolley dilemmas uh, with, you know, they have some explanations or in this case, for example, so you have a, a car, there's three in the car, there's all sorts of combinations over here. And then it tells you what's happening with them. So um, some of them are injured, some of them, you know, this will result in some injured, some dead. And why it's happening because of a brake failure. So about to hit this, but then you have the ability to that divert to uh, this over here, thereby killing everybody in the car. So you can see the um, skeleton, meaning who is going to die, who is going to be injured. And in this case, all the people in the car are going to, to die. So you can just like browse these, have a look at you know, how people have answered this. So every possible combination, kids, robbers, criminals, elderly, men, women, cats, dogs, uh, what else is here? Oh, some some people with seat belt, some people without seat belt, 
So it has something to do with responsibility. Uh, women, some pregnant, some not, elderly, a car with no passengers whatsoever, and then they diverting into another lane. So contrasting every possible thing. So if you go and you design this, you can actually decide who do you want to, um, to decide between? Do you want pedestrian versus pedestrians or pedestrians ahead versus passengers? Like whatever the combination is, let's say that we want this kind of thing. Are there any legal complications about the legal crossing ahead, illegal crossing ahead? So let's say, uh, did they, the passenger, the pedestrians, did they cross this because they uh, were allowed to? So let's say it was kind of legal and then you can put all sorts of things over here. Cats, dogs, you know, and add as many as many as you want. So is it going to kill this one or is it going to kill that one? And then you can submit the scenario and then this is added to their database and then other people will respond to this and you will receive the, the results. So if you want to construct your trolley dilemma and have millions of people answering your scenarios, this is the way to go. You can name this. People actually um, uh, add the comments. So there's a whole discussion not on this one, but some of them have like interesting discussions if they're very, very popular. And then, of course, you can make a judgment. Which one would you prefer? So in this case, you know, if you don't divert, everybody's going to be killed. But if you divert, you're going to kill these folks over here. So one male doctor, two male executives uh, versus um, one female doctor, two female executives. So lots of interesting things about this. I love playing around with this and seeing what people are saying. It's uh, really one of the best experiments that we've ever done in social psychology. I hope that someday with the 120 heuristics and biases that we've done, that we can construct a website a little bit like that, because I think that's, uh, that's the best that we can get to in social psychology. This is the moral compass that uh, he was uh, describing. So there's the different clusters, the Western, the Eastern, and Southern, the Latin American slash French that he was uh, talking about. And they have the different dimensions and it's really interesting to see how these uh, differ. So the preference for inaction, not taking action, sparing humans, uh, sparing more lives, uh, sparing the young, sparing higher status, uh, lawful, sparing the fit and so forth. If you look at this, there's actually quite, quite a few uh, very interesting takes uh, from this. So you can see the general preference for inaction. So this is across the different, so all the cultures together in one sample. There is a, a preference for uh, females. I don't know what this is about, but you want to spare the fit over the unfit, the large. Spare the higher status over sparing the lower status. This is kind of curious, right? Sparing the lawful against the unlawful, okay? Sparing the young, this is uh, quite big over the elderly with the one exception perhaps in the Eastern cultures. Sparing more characters and sparing humans over sparing uh, pets. Preference in favor of sparing specific uh, characters. What do you see here that's curious for you? What stands out when you look at this? People what? <laughs> they don't like cats. <laughs> yeah. Dogs is higher than cats, and cats are like the bottom of the pile. Yeah. You're saying this is sad? <laughs> Where would you put the cat? The top, number one? <laughs> yeah. Do you want this to be above the criminal or just above the dog or above everything? Yeah, it's a good question. Where would you put the cat if you like cats, right? Yeah, no. It's a good anecdote. Anything else curious that you see? Criminal at the bottom. Like less, less than a dog. Criminal is less than a dog. So that's curious. What else? Sorry? Occupation, what do you see? Yeah, yeah. So doctors seem to be very highly regarded. Why? I could explain. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I guess there's some of that going on, right? They've already helped save so many lives and they will continue to help lives so they're in service of others. 
Good. Any other things that you see that are very curious here? If you're what? Obese, yeah. Yeah. So this definitely reflects some of our biases, right? Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Also, I think it's interesting, like seeing a, a female and then a pregnant and then like a stroller. So like a pregnant with a baby inside versus a stroller. I don't know. There's just like a, so many interesting things here. I don't know where to even begin to untangle this, but only when you have this kind of data set with hundreds of millions, can you come to these kinds of rankings that really help us understand not only morality, but also humanity reflecting on who we are as humans, really outstanding. So the question that we talked about before, will people actually buy the utilitarian cars or driver, driverless cars should sacrifice their passenger to save more pedestrians, except for my, my car, of course. So people will not be willing to, to buy this. There's an additional uh, challenge. So the question is, will people try and or even succeed in manipulating the system or perhaps if you're higher status and you have some money, will you be able to change the preferences of a self-driving autonomous vehicle? So I like this cartoon over here. Can I interest you in an extra protection with this uh, 2000 US dollars bracelet? Driverless cars can see you as a baby because baby on a stroller is the highest one. So if we really program, the self-driving autonomous vehicles to follow what the moral machines tells us that we prefer, then perhaps somebody will be able to manipulate this in order to get the self-driving autonomous vehicles to look at us in a different way that would prioritize us over, over others. So will people really buy utilitarian cars? Let's see what the people that did the study have to say. So this is what we did with my collaborators, Jean-Francois Bonafon and Bazaim Sharif, we ran a survey in which we presented people with these types of scenarios. And we gave them two options, inspired by two philosophers, Jeremy Bentham and Immanuel Kant. Bentham says the car should follow utilitarian ethics. It should take the action that will minimize total harm, even if that action will kill a bystander, and even if that action will kill the passenger. Immanuel Kant says, the car should follow duty-bound principles, like thou shalt not kill. So you should not take an action that explicitly harms a human being, and you should let the car take its course, even if that's going to harm more people. What do you think? Bentham or Kant? Here's what we found. Most people sided with Bentham. So it seems that people want cars to be utilitarian, minimize total harm, and that's what we should all do. Problem solved. But there is a little catch. When we asked people whether they would purchase such cars, they said, absolutely not. <laughs> they would like to buy cars that protect them at all costs, but they want everybody else to buy cars that minimize harm. Yeah, I certainly recommend that you go and watch the entire video because both of these, uh, the three researchers, so you saw both in the first video and the third one is here, are doing groundbreaking research since the Nature paper they've published uh, again and again on this using this data set and, and wonderful, wonderful uh, insights that come from, from this collaboration. This is an interesting uh, thing that happened in Sweden. This is an actual paper that was published here in this uh, journal, economics journal. Uh, do people avoid opportunities to donate? So interestingly, even when I was living in the Netherlands, uh, you carry your plastics or your cans or your bottles. And then when you are about to walk into a supermarket, you can feed this into a machine that will give you a refund that you can use in order to buy things in the supermarket. Do we have something like this in Hong Kong? Maybe I missed it. Not really, right? You, we do? Where? They give, but there are many elderly trying to collect home food and feed the machine so that they can get some. Oh, right. Yeah. So definitely, not only in Hong Kong, in many places in the world, you have homeless people that are going into the garbage cans and getting the plastic because they can get a refund in some collection center. Yeah, I know, I know about that. But having those machines next to the supermarkets, I don't think I've seen that here, but very popular in Europe, Scandinavia, in the Netherlands. 
And what's interesting about this experiment is that they decided to implement an option. So you can see they have two options here. The first option is to just do what the machine did before, and that is to give you a refund that you can actually go and use in the supermarket. The second option was for you to donate that sum to some good cause, charitable giving. The interesting thing that they noticed is that actually people tended to recycle a lot less. So before that, they had the recycling rates that were X. And then after they introduced this button, people recycled less. Even more curious is that what they noticed is that when they looked at the recycling rates of the entire, the entire city, that has not changed. What has changed is that people, rather than going to that machine that has the two buttons, decided to go to a different supermarket that has a machine that doesn't have this option. What they drew from this, their conclusion was that people don't want to be faced with moral dilemmas. They don't want to have to think, oh my God, am I going to use this now to get a refund or should I donate this? I would rather go to a machine that doesn't give me that choice. So rates overall stay the same, but the rates in, in machines that introduced this next to supermarkets that gave you that option, rates went down. So that's something very curious about the way that we behave as humans. Sometimes we don't want to be part of the decision-making of whether we should donate or not. So very, very interesting findings. Now, we can think, especially during a pandemic, about all sorts of applications uh, for this. Uh, this became very urgent two years ago. So when I was giving these kinds of um, uh, classes, uh, first we moved to Zoom, then it became clear that we have some urgent decisions that we need to make about things like who gets uh, ventilators. So the beginning when we didn't have vaccines, this was the most uh, urgent thing. So who, who gets to, to decide this? So my sister is a doctor. She's just finishing her uh, med school during that time, having to go to a hospital. And what she describes is utter chaos. I don't know if you know anybody that works in a hospital, but how do you make these kinds of decisions? So for example, trolley dilemmas when they have to uh, ventilators at the beginning of the pandemic, let's say there comes in a person and you hook them up to a ventilator. Let's say that you've decided that a baby's life is worth more than an elderly's life. So it comes in this elderly, you give them a ventilator. That's the only ventilator that you have. And then somebody comes with, with a baby. Do you unhook the person, the elderly, in order to hook up the, the baby? Who gets to make these kinds of decisions? Should it come from the hospital authority? Should the nurses and doctors make these kind of decisions? And I know that for doctors, it's very, very difficult. For interns like my sister back then, very, very difficult to decide this kind of thing. And then the vaccines came out. Now everybody can go and get this, at least in Hong Kong, no problem. But when it first started, I don't know why, but the Hong Kong authority decided that I'm a priority, so I get first access to a vaccine. But why me? Why not somebody else in a hospital who gets to get the vaccines first, who gets to decide that? who gets to prioritize this. So you can see how at least the US decided to handle this. They had phases, uh, phase one, phase two. So really K-12 teachers or people in academia for some reason are in phase two. I don't know why. So all the phases, it's really interesting to try and decide on this. But if you were thinking, what is the role of social psychologists? What do social psychologists contribute to society? We have a big role to play. So suddenly all these trauma dilemmas seem a lot more related to what's happening in the real world. Um, so all kinds of ethical concerns and how we uh, address those uh, in the literature. If you want a really good episode, it's generally a podcast that I strongly recommend, uh, focusing on behavioral economics, a little bit of social psychology, then free economics that is based on the book that came out over a decade ago, 15. So now it's uh, they have a lot of amazing season nine already, I think. So two years ago, now they're season 11, I think. So talking about ventilators, who gets the ventilator? Talking about all the dilemmas that happened during the pandemic, 
all these real life trolley dilemmas, who makes the decision? How do we make these kinds of things? So a bioethicist and an economist will talk about this. Okay, we'll move on to factfulness. This is summary of morality. I know that we've raised more questions than we've answered, but this is all to say that there's a room for you to come and contribute. Lots of interesting topics. So if this is of interest to you and you want to build your career on this or you want to do something about this, many opportunities. I laid out some directions, but during this course, at least some of the groups will have to deal with some of these, uh, these topics. Factfulness. So what is factfulness? I'll have a, a quiz for you to get a little bit a sense of the your general knowledge when it comes to factfulness. But first, I have a general question to discuss with you. Do you feel like the world is getting better or worse or worse? Thinking generally about the world, all things considered, do you think that over time the world is one? getting better to neither getting better or getting worse or getting worse. Try and think about this for a bit. What do you think most people around us think about this question? Not you specifically, but as a group, what do you think most people are inclined to say about this? Sorry? Getting better? Yeah, so you're saying uh, we have technological advances, people are able to notice this, so they're feeling that the technological advance, uh, advances are uh, related to whether the world is getting better or not. Therefore, most people say getting better. Any other predictions? Yes. Mm. Yeah, so we have an over-optimistic view of our surroundings. We would like to think that things are getting better to help us feel better about ourselves and the world. Good point, yes. Yeah, okay, good Good point. You think we're getting worse? You think that also other people think that they're getting worse? Perhaps. Okay, let's start with you. So there's war. J just uh, where is there a war? Huh? Oh, in the Ukraine. Yeah, okay. What, what, what's the second thing? Living costs? The living cost is very high. Okay, costs are getting higher. Mm -hmm. And uh, Okay, so on one side, technology is getting better. So uh, quality of life perhaps is, is improving, but on the other side, you're saying no war. He's pointing out to the one great war that's happening right now in the Ukraine, plus leaving costs. Anything else to come? Yeah? Yeah, we have some climate challenges. No, no, good. Yeah. So I hope you don't mind me asking you because you're the first who said getting better and focusing on technology but now reflecting about this a little bit you're noticing some other things like climate change oh, okay okay your personal focus was on this but you think most people would focus on technology yeah technology advances in that rather than climate change and some of the challenges you wanted to say something yeah good yeah, yeah i appreciate that thank you so i, ha I have a, a few uh, questions for you uh, one question is, when you say something is hard, do you think this is an impossible thing to quantify or just very difficult? So when you say hard and difficult, what do you mean by this? Impossible. So if we put all our minds to it, we can't quantify whether it's, it's improving or not. Yeah, so the world is fast and it's hard to conceptualize the whole world. Mm. Mm. It's like emotions. Mm. You can't quantify it. And yeah. Our experiences are very reliable. Mm. Because we have emotions, it's difficult to quantify this as human beings. Yeah. Difficult to evaluate this. Yeah. And our personal experiences. Our personal experience. Right. Yeah. Any reflections on this? Yeah. Uh, not particularly on that. Okay. I think, like, um, you know, even from another perspective, we can even consider the positive developments to. Um, worsen the world in a certain way because, mm. like, the world is developed in you know unequal way, mm. and like the technological advancement, they benefit or they are concentrated in certain areas of the world, right? Right. So the more things develop in those areas, mm. that means like 
a general inequality is not exacerbated. Mm -hmm. so that would mean the world is getting worse. Yeah. So you're pointing out just some differences between different places in the world, different economies or different advances having more impact on one place in the world rather than the other. So even that question is relative to where you are in the world. We have access to a nice aircon over here, but perhaps people in other places are experiencing the same weather outside don't have access to aircon, so maybe they have more of an impact on this kind of thing. Yeah, very good. So we're gonna do a little bit of a, of a quiz to see, uh, even though we said it's impossible to quantify this, we're gonna try and quantify this a little bit, at least with some respect. Uh, to some things and then we're going to touch on comparisons between what we are experiencing here in Hong Kong and some other places so before we take a break we'll, we'll do this uh, I just I'm curious to see this so most of you are, are a bit pessimistic about this so more in line with you rather than <laughs> sorry what I actually get... oh you're getting better <laughs> so you're one of the two that said uh, getting better so that makes everybody very pessimistic. Uh, did you or you, oh, you said you personally feel that it's getting worse? Okay, interesting. So seven three two. That's something to reflect on. All right. Um, so we'll start with uh, questions. We'll do thirteen of these questions, and there are right or wrong answers to this. I want your best guess. Once you're ready, I'll ask you to answer each one of those, and then we'll see together what the answer is to each one of those. Are you ready? Yeah? Sure. You're not ready for the questions? <laughs> okay, let's start. In all of the low-income countries that are across the world today, how many girls finish primary school? 20%, 40%, or 60%? Right, time's up, everybody's voted. So most of you felt like it's 20%, but the actual answer is 60%. Moving on. Oh, first of all, we see who is, who is ahead. So good job for Johnny. Well done. Question two. <clears throat> Where does the majority of the world population live today? Low-income countries, middle-income countries, or high-income countries? Okay, we got all the votes in. Good. And the answer is middle-income countries. So most of you got this correct. Well done. Okay. So now we have a bit more of a competition, I guess. Good. All right, next one. Question three. In the last 20 years, the proportion of the world's population living in extreme poverty has almost doubled, remained more or less the same, almost half. Are these difficult questions or very easy? Difficult? Do you feel like you know these, these answers? No, almost half. So, okay, some of you are like about the same. Almost half is, is the right answer over here. Okay, let's move on. What is the life expectancy of the world today? 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. And the answer is 70 years. Good, some of you are picking this up. All right. Question five, there are 2 billion children in the world today from zero to 15. How many children will there be in the year 2100 according to the UN? It's the rate of children going up, going down, staying the same. So they're gonna stay the same, 2 billion, okay? The UN predicts that by 2100, the world population will have increased by another 4 billion people. What is the main reason? A little bit related to the other question. More children, more adults, or more old people? Yeah, more adults. Okay, where do we stand? Let's see, where are we? Okay, interesting, there's a tie. Question seven. How did the number of deaths per year from natural disaster change over the last hundred years? Had just Pakistan happening right now. More than doubled, remained about the same, decreased to less than half. Times up. Decreased to less than half. Moving on, question eight. 
There are roughly 7 billion people in the world today. Which map shows best where they live? Each person in the figure represents 1 billion people. So most of them in Asia, kind of more spread around. A, B, C. Time's up. Yeah, most of you got this right. Most of them are in Asia. Question nine. How many of the world's one-year-old children today have been vaccinated against some disease? Looking at the entire world, 20%, 50%, 80%. Yeah, good. Question 10. Worldwide, 30-year-old men have spent 10 years in school. On average, how many years have women spent the same age Nine years, six years, three years, compared to the 10 years for men. Nine years, getting closer to men. 11. In 1996, tigers, giant pandas, and black rhinos were listed as endangered. How many of these three species are more critically endangered today? Two of them, one of them, none of them. Tigers, giant pandas, and black rhinos. None of them. Okay, getting closer to the end. 12. How many people in the world have some access to electricity? Talking about aircon. 20, 50, 80. 80%. Indeed. Last question. Global climate experts believe that over the next 100 years, the average temperature will get warmer, remain the same, get colder. We don't get 100% on this. <laughs> okay, good. Get warmer. All right, so let's see the, the final one. It's a tie, so we've got like, uh, so the highest score was seven out of 13. So even the best performers did about half, half right, half not right, just just over over half. So before we go on a break, what, what is this about? What was I trying to show you here? What is this quiz about? So this is a little bit in line with what you said about technological advances, right? Yeah. Is that what you all got from this? Anything else that you got from this? We, we might not know a lot about the world. Uh, how did you feel that? Anything surprised you? Yeah, half of this stuff you actually don't know. Did you expect to know more about the world? Yeah. Did some of you feel like you're guessing a lot or did you feel that you knew something but then were surprised by the result? What was the feeling? Guessing or you knew something but it was wrong? The latter? Okay, you knew something but it was wrong. Okay, very good. So let's take a five minute break, come back and discuss this point. So I want to introduce you to two important figures. Thinkers, unfortunately, the one on the left, Hans Rosling, passed away three years ago, but his legacy continues with his family. His son took over. And the quiz that you just did is from Gapminder, which is a nonprofit formed by Hans Rosling and appears in the book. And is a quiz that is aiming to test your knowledge about the world. And I really like the title of this book, saying Factfulness, 10 Reasons We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think. And when we ask ourselves, is something better or worse? I understand the challenge in quantifying this. It's very, very difficult. It seems very confusing. There's lots of distractions out there, and we are based on intuitions, emotions. We have all sorts of biases that distort our view of the world, which is why Hans Rosling, 
who started as a medical doctor, but then volunteered in different parts of the world and then ended up advising many world leaders about health-related policies, calls for factfulness. Because when he was advising the world leaders, when he went around the Nobel Prize winning uh, scholars in Sweden, when he was giving his courses, he realized that a lot of people are very ignorant about the world. They don't make their decisions based on what the world is. They make their decisions based on very distorted view of what the world is. Another very important thinker, a social psychologist slash uh, uh, linguistics scholar is Steven Pinker. He wrote many books. I recommend all of them. The latest one, um, I think, no, the latest one is uh, Rationality, came out last, last year. This one is the one before that called Enlightenment Now, the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress, saying that we need to use the principles of enlightenment in order to rationally, using scientific values, look at the world and assess in how we should progress uh, further, how we should make uh, decisions. So if you want to give this uh, quiz to others to see how well they perform, you can go on Gapminder. Here are the answers to all of that. So um, in 2017, all, you know, 12,000, by now I think it's already closer to uh, millions of people who are taking this. Gapminder has really grown very fast and I'll show you some of the tools that Gapminder uh, uses. I'll let uh, Hans Rosling introduce this. He has a lot of, before he passed away, he did a lot of TED Talks. This is one of his earliest ones where he introduced the Gapminder app. So before he did this, nobody was able to visualize what is happening in the world very well. And one of the things that he really does very well is just like you said uh, before about differences in the world between different regions, he was able to show how the different regions in the world move the trends moving towards more progress and doing better. And he's a real icon. Uh, he's entertaining. He has a lot of uh, lively spirit and uh, really made a big change in the way that people perceive science, facts, and policymaking. So let's see it from Hans Rosling. Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. So he gave this uh, test to his uh, Swedish students, asking them things like, which country has the highest child mortality, uh, contrasting different uh, countries, and then seeing how they answer, and then seeing how, how good their score is. So this is testing their knowledge about the world, and this is what he found. And these were the results of the Swedish students. I did it, so I got a confidence interval, which was pretty narrow, and I got happy, of course. I had 1.8 right answer out of five possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health and for my course. <laughs> but one light, late night, when I was compiling the report, I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. <laughs> because the chimpanzee would score half right. If I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey, they would be right, half of the cases. But the students are not there. The problem for me was not ignorance, it was preconceived ideas. I did also an unethical study of the professors of the Karolinska Institute that hands out the Nobel Prize in medicine, and they are on par with the chimpanzee there. <laughs> so this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate, because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. The, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? <laughs> and they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life in small family. And third world is short life in large family. So this is what I could display here. 
I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we start the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China. They're moving against better health. They're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries, and they get larger families, but they, no, longer lives, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning, and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. Beautiful tool. An amazing presentation. He's really very engaging, isn't he? Uh, and it, it's it's lovely to see it this way because before he did this tool, you know, when you look at the numbers and you see some of the graphs, you don't get the perspective of the change. You haven't experienced some of that change. I I have. I don't date back all the way to the 1960s, but I definitely saw some of this uh, happening. Funny the, the HIV pandemic uh, um, the situation in Africa, but really the development in the world. I think a lot of the world, perhaps you already entered the world when things were a little bit more equal. Some places in the world are still doing less uh, less well than we, we do, but generally things today are better than they used to be. So in the 1960s, we had this uh, very unequal kind of world, but then by the time of this TED talk in 2006, I think already the world is looking much better. Uh, what happened between 2006 and 2022? So actually, we can keep uh, looking at this. Uh, now Gapminder has a, an amazing interface. Everything, of course, is web-based. So whenever somebody asks you to quantify, um, is the world getting better or getting worse? You can ask them, okay, what is your measure of getting better or getting worse? And you can actually plug these things in. So for example, you can look not life expectancy, but babies per women, communication, economy. There's like so many factors. So they took all the best stats in the world, from the World Bank, from the UN, from many nonprofits. Now you have access to that in a way that you can visualize it and look at the trends over time. So for example, here, I just took what it is that uh, they've done. No, okay, so uh, life expectancy and income. The beginning of the 19th century and then being able to look at this over time so i can press play just like he did and then see all sorts of trends another thing that we can do is we can focus on one specific country uh, is there somebody that wants to add a country here let's focus on one or two countries what countries would you like to focus on let's say barbados yeah wh why this one okay uh is there somebody here that's not from hong kong Actually, oh, where are you from? Barbados, Malaysia, and Macau. Okay, so I think um, I don't know about Macau because it like transferred and, like, but Malaysia is definitely here. Uh, I grew up in Israel. We can put that in. Uh, when did Malaysia gain its uh, independence? Like nineteen sixties. Okay, so Israel only started in 1948. Malaysia, I think 1960s or so, a little bit before Singapore, so maybe 50s. Um, so from the 19th century, starting from there, it's not very applicable to these two, but maybe we can do something a bit closer to us in our region. So let's say China. 
Um, yeah, so we can just like play this and, and see what happens. So you can look at the trend just like uh, he did over there and see how things uh, evolve over time. And uh, you can zoom on different, uh, so Israel, Barbados, and Malaysia are not yet starting out. But then the things that really happen from the 20th century are remarkable. So most of the life expectancy and income are over here, but you can see really very fast growing. It's amazing what's happening with China. So China is here, China is here, but then beginning of the 1990s, just look how, how China is catching up. It's just remarkable how this is, how fast this is uh, going. And it's a very clear trend where in less than a decade, all of these countries are going to be here together. So terrific stuff that you can play with. So if there's something that you want to know about whether the world is getting better or worse, this is the, this is the way for you to do this is another aspect of this. Uh, so child mortality over here, seeing very high child mortality uh, when it comes to income. Let's speed this up for the 19th century. Still, many of them very high child mortality, but because of advances in technology and in medicine, you can see them bouncing around, Spanish flu, all sorts of things that are happening across the world. But really, during the 20th century, it's very, it's remarkable just to see what has happened both with the income, but also the decrease in child mortality. And if you uh, look at this, this is like 500, 200, 100. So the scale is not even, it's logarithmic and, uh, and decreased to uh, rates of, uh, you know, very, very low, around 20, 50, even in the African countries that are very uh, low, low income still. So when you plot these things over here and you play around with this, it becomes a lot clearer that actually uh, the world, at least with technological advances, health advances, is getting much better. A uh, good question to ask generally people is that if you could choose to be born at any time in the history, when would you be rather, when would you rather be born? So I think almost any time uh, you would have major challenges. If you would have this pandemic uh, before we had vaccines or treatments or the advances of science, mRNA, we would be in a much worse uh, situation and this could have ended up being a lot worse than, than it really is. Ability to even masks, you know, mass manufacture masks very, very fast. Address policies have apps on our phones in order to track these things and address a global pandemic. So our world in data is one of the extraordinary nonprofits that was established in order to take the best stats that we have right now in the world in order to try and quantify what is happening right now and to make sense of this. So just the issue of uh, child mortality, uh, this uh, tragedy of enormous scale and how we've been able to address this over time. So we're very lucky over here in Hong Kong because where is Hong Kong? Over here, first of all, Hong Kong is one of the highest income in the world. It's unbelievable how well Hong Kong is doing. Uh, the only ones that are getting anywhere close to where Hong Kong is is Singapore and Norway. But when you look at this, really, this, these trends around the world, we are quite the exception, both in terms of income and in terms of very, very low child mortality rates. But the world is moving towards that, where most of the world even now is lower than 10%. So there's still a way for us to go. So if you look at this website and you look at the trends, you just want to know how far we've come. We've started from something between 30 and 60%, which basically means a coin toss. You're having a baby. You know, maybe it will survive. Maybe it won't survive. Can you imagine a world where half of the baby is being born? end up being dead. Horrible. Where are we right now? We're very close to Iceland here in Hong Kong. So very, very close to zero, 0.2%. 0 Still a way to go. We want this to be zero for the entire world. But really, it's, it's a major, a major achievement. So if we add Hong Kong over here, then uh, where is Hong Kong? Oh, it's the same kind of graph. Say, for example, China data here from China. So China started in the 1950s with about 31%, so very high rates, and then going down all the way to uh, Hong Kong and Iceland. So it's interesting. You can really play with this. You can also have a map of the mortality. So we have big issues over here in Africa. 
So one of the things that you can do as a social psychologist when you graduate here at HKU is contribute to these kinds of nonprofits in order to make data more accessible and help decision makers get accurate views of the world so that they know where to invest and how to do things more efficiently. And also making sure that they have a balanced view that not everything is horrible and we are on a trend becoming better over time. How many people get this uh, quiz correctly? So I think our rates were a bit uh, higher than usual. So we had a little bit, you know, some of us were able to cross the 50% the um, uh, threshold, but then you can look at each one of these questions and see how people generally do. Not a uh, highly educated uh, top of the creme de la creme being HKU students, but you know, the average people in Sweden, US, South Korea, so Swedish people about 11%. Uh, Spain 4%. So this is a really biased uh, view of the world, at least when it comes to uh, how many girls finish primary school. And I think we also did quite badly here as a class regarding this, this kind of question. Um, another remarkable thing about how we've been able to address uh, poverty, still some places in the world are uh, living on a, on a bare minimum. But if you look at extreme poverty, the way that uh, we define it officially, uh, it has really decreased since the beginning of the 19th century, all the way to about 9% uh, five, five years ago. And it's, it's been going down, continues to go down uh, since then. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to, to notice this. Now, when I grew up in Israel at the beginning of the you know, 1980s, um, Israel was not doing well. <laughs> so... I would even say that uh, most of Israel was experiencing wars all the time and the economy was not great. But then in the 2000s, uh, realizing the high-tech industry, now Israel is a very developed economy doing extremely well. So at least I've seen the miracle of from a very poor country, you know, just starting out to becoming a, a well-developed uh, economy. So it's quite remarkable to, to notice this. And as I go different places around the world, lived in Taiwan, lived in Hong Kong, seen all sorts of things, the, the, the remarkable changes that have happened to some of these places. Also recently in South Central America and in Africa, un unbelievable to see these changes with your, with your own eyes to experience this kind of change. So the drop in absolute poverty. Um, so Rosling, Hans Rosling, when he summarized this kind of thing, he said, situation is bad because we still have these rates you know, of 9.6% uh, poverty, but it is getting better. And there's something that we can do in order to address this and make this even better still. Life expectancy. Some people say, I have this nostalgic view. I would much rather be born in the 19th century. Really, if you were born in the 19th century, your average life expectancy would be 31 years, unless you're the king or queen or emperor. Most people were farmers. Most of the day spent out in the fields, in the sun, crouching over things, you know, farming rice, corn, whatever that is, to make money for the affluent, for the kings and queens. So very bad uh, life for people at the beginning of the 19th century. But where we are right now is that we can expect to live at the very least 70 uh, years on average. And in Hong Kong, we're actually doing much better than that. I think we can have one of the highest in the world here in Hong Kong. So we are very lucky and privileged. And uh, we can expect at least your generation or your kids' generation to live beyond that. Some people even say that perhaps your generation or the, your kids are going to live forever because of technological advances. So I probably missed the train, but you might catch it. We'll see. Uh, where are most of the people in the world? So we are where things are happening right now. So China, India, Indonesia is a very large country. Even Pakistan that we don't pay attention to. Like very lar large populations that uh, we need to take into consideration that are the, the center of where population is right now uh, in the world. Uh, we care about equality, and it's been bad for women throughout the, the ages, but things are definitely getting better. Um, even in Hong Kong, you know, we would still like for women to uh, you know, have the more of executives. Uh, I think Carrie Lam was a good example of how 
and women can, can get into positions of power and become decision makers. We would want to see more and more of that. In psychology, uh, yeah, definitely most uh, women, I think, <laughs> were way above 50% for women, but not, not only in undergraduate. If you go to some of our seminars in postgraduate, if you look at our faculty, uh, if you look at uh, the head of the department is, is a woman, um, the acting dean right now is a woman, the vice chancellor, a woman. So things are changing even in Hong Kong, at least in psychology. Uh, I did uh, study in a business school where things are a bit different over there. So hopefully uh, women will uh, have uh, more participation, uh, at least equality, if not more than that, across the fields. But at least that they're not just in Hong Kong, but around the world, they're catching up to to men and sometimes even even um, exceeding so we'll see a little bit of hands rolling in terms of uh, vaccinations and i want you to pay attention to uh, why why is this happening is this happening because we're not doing a good enough job in education is this happening because we don't know how to figure out the facts or is there something else that's biasing us that's causing this why do we have ignorance and bias? The challenge we have now, you know, is to get away from the understand where the majority is. And that was very clearly shown in this question. We asked, what is the percentage of the world's one-year-old children who have got those basic vaccines against measles and other things that we've had for many years? 20, 50 or 80 percent. Now, this is what the US public and the Swedish answered. And you see, look at the Swedish result, you know what the right answer is. <laughs> Who the heck is professor of global health in that country? Well, well, it's me. It's me. You see? It's very difficult, this. It's very difficult. Huh? However, Ula's approach to really measure what we know made headlines. And CNN published these results on their web, and they had the questions there, millions answered. And I think there was about there was about 2,000 comments, and this was one of the comments, you know. I bet no member of the media passed the test, he said. <laughs> so Ola told me, take these devices, you are invited to media conferences, give it to them and measure what the media know. And ladies and gentlemen, for the first time, the informal result from a conference with US media. And then, lately, from the European Union media. You see, the problem is not that people don't read and listen to the media. The problem is that the media doesn't know themselves. <laughs> what shall we do about this, Ula? Do you have any idea? The kind of things that are reported in the media by media reporters uh, include a lot of bias, which biases us. Plus, the media have their own agenda in the stuff that they would like to talk about which is something that we need to take into consideration. Uh, our world in data really does a very good job at summarizing just the improvements in uh, literacy, uh, basic education, extreme poverty going down, education going up, child mortality, vaccination, um, uh, democracy, and so forth. Um, I'm going to skip this. These are slides that I had to adjust a little bit in the last year or two, uh, because uh, two years ago, when I first made this slide, uh, adopted this from others, I had this slide that said, since the 1950s, the world has become more peaceful, healthy, wealthy, well-nourished, educated, connected, gender equal, and tolerant, with a lot of zeros. And the zeros that I had was, uh, so how many nuclear weapons have been used in conflict? Zero. How many Western European countries have fought each other? Zero. So this is Western European. So I could still keep this at zero. How many major developed countries have fought each other? Zero. How many developed countries have expanded the territory by conquering other countries? So I had to make a slight adjustment here. No longer zero. Nobody can explain what has happened with Russia. Completely irrational, deviating from the global trends. So now it's one. But it's interesting to see what has happened uh, over there. I think what's... Uh, remarkable is that the European Union was not doing very well before the uh, the crisis, but because of this war, the European Union is now better than ever. So suddenly, 
you know, Finland and Sweden are joining, joining NATO and uh, the Ukraine, which never thought of, you know, are they going to join the European Union? Yes or no, are on the way to join Europe. Nobody is thinking of withdrawing from NATO and European Union anymore. So devastating what is happening over there. Reading the news about what's happening in that war is horrible, but uh, has not happened. It's has still to be seen what's going to happen over there. It seems like there's some pushback and the Ukrainians are, are holding. Uh, plus, the Europeans are more united than ever. The world is more united together against this kind of aggression than ever. So even though this is one, still optimistic about this. How many states have disappeared through conquest? Zero so far. So just looking at war, which we talked about, what is the state of war? So there was a little bit of a misalignment. You were saying there's more wars in the world, but just like, see, I grew up in war. Um, I am a country that experienced a lot of these wars, but looking at the overall trend from let's say the 16th century to where we are right now, the number of wars from the second world war now, after we had the First World War, the beginning of the, the 20th century, Second World War, people just imagine because of the Cold War that there's going to be another big war coming between developed countries or empires. And so far, it seems like the trend is that this is, this is decreasing and all the predictions, the bad negative predictions have, have failed. It remains to be seen what's going to happen, but the trend overall seems to be generally very positive. What are the sources of the bias? Why do we have such a biased view of the world that looks at things as being more negative than perhaps they, they are? Um, there is some ignorance, but it's mostly about, uh, I think was mentioned here, emotions, intuitions, some personal bias, uh, and media is definitely has something to do with this. And also I think us as educators, we don't pay enough attention to helping you figuring out the facts so everything that we give you is a little bit biased we don't teach you how to learn we teach you what it is that we know it's a big a big difference from i think what the education should be about which is why in this in this course we will try and teach you how to seek out facts and our world in data gapminder these sources of information are where i want you to go and seek your information in order to make sense of what's happening in the world. So there's all sorts of different biases. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. I'm going to focus on uh, a few of those specific ones. I think when we look at the media, when we read things, when we process things, we really want to dichotomize things. We want to look at the wealthy versus the poor, the, you know, the rich on one side and those who don't have anything on the other side. We try to create two different groups, ignoring all the gray that's in the, in the middle, black and white. But actually, in most cases, there is a distribution. There is a lot of people that are in the middle. Most of us are in the middle between these two very extremes. So we tend to focus on one side versus the other side, but most of us are somewhere here. So you need to understand the majority. Like you pointed out in the Gapminder quiz, most of the countries are middle income right now. So it's not just uh, the most wealthy uh, versus the poor, but overall there is a sort of trend if you compare everything together. So you don't compare the extreme. You really need to know what the distribution actually uh, looks like. In science, sometimes when you read articles, the tendency is to do uh, these kinds of graphs. We really try and move away from these because they don't give you a lot of information. All they give you are means. There is a problem with means. Sometimes we need to look at a distribution. So we try and move to jitter dot, these kind of graphs that actually show you. So sometimes you can understand that it's not, this is a very limited view of what's happening. But when you look at the entire distribution, you can see different trends or what's happening actually with your data. So here's from Twitter. Uh, friends don't let friends make bar plots. So even when you see plots, you need to understand, am I looking at the right plot or is there a better way to represent this data? One of the most influential papers in uh, social psychology, uh, a group of people that, I, that I'm familiar with, uh, has 7,445 citations. It's called Bad 
is stronger than good. We pay a lot more attention to bad than we do for good. Recently came a book, uh, came out two or three years ago, The Power of Bad. Strongly recommend this. Um, Roy Baumeister is uh, one of our most prolific social psychologists, really uh, amazing work throughout the years. And he covers this, teaming up with uh, John, who will see a video talking about this, uh, this sort of thing. And this is how it's summarized. The greater power of bad events over good ones is found in everyday events, major life events, trauma, close relationship outcomes, social network patterns, interactions and learning processes, bad emotions, bad parents, and bad feedback have more impact than good ones. And bad information is processed more thoroughly than good. The self is more motivated to avoid bad self-definitions than to pursue good ones. Bad impressions and bad stereotypes are quicker to form and more resistant to this confirmation than good ones. So it's something that we need to take into uh, account. And there is a way why the media focuses on the negative. It just lingers in our mind more. It brings in more clicks. It brings in more money. So let's see how it's described in the video by one of the authors, John. It's not just in your head. When it comes to how we all experience life, bad is generally stronger than good. We remember trauma more than we remember joy. We're brought down by criticism more than we're elevated by praise. And we pay more attention to bad news than good. A new book called The Power of Bad by journalist John Tierney and psychologist Roy F. Baumeister explores the negativity effect or the universal tendency for negative events and emotions to affect us more strongly than positive ones. The negativity effect shapes everything we do, from our personal relationships, to how we do our careers, to how we vote, to what media we consume. But The Power of Bad isn't just one more cause for despair. The book's subtitle is How the Negativity Effect Rules Us and How We Can Rule It. And it offers practical tips on all sorts of ways to approach life so that we can be happy, productive, and well-adjusted. I sat down with John Tierney, a contributing editor at the Manhattan Institute City Journal and a former New York Times columnist and reporter, to talk about the root causes of the negativity effect and how to combat it. John Tierney, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks. So explain the negativity effect. What, what is it? It's the universal tendency for, uh, for bad events, bad emotions to affect us more strongly than good ones. It's also called negativity bias. It, it's basically this tendency that, um, uh, um, that bad parenting makes a big difference, good parenting doesn't. Yeah. Um, criticism hurts so much more than praise does. Um, there's much more brain activity when you see something negative than when you see something positive. Can you give uh, give some concrete examples of this? Uh, you know, where where bad clearly overpowers good. Well, a bad first impression is really tough to shake. Whereas a good first impression can be overcome. You know, very. You can quickly. always screw it up later. Right. Uh, exactly. And, yeah. and you know, um, penalties work a lot better than rewards um, as far as motivating people. One, you know, and we have a chapter in the book about how. Uh, looking at the history of religions, that religions that, that preach hell grow much faster than ones that basically <laughs> promise you eternal rewards. People, you know, that's what fills the pews. You know, people, resp I mean, the brain just evolved to respond to bad things. Um, yeah, we won't do this now, but I want you to get to um, Steven Pinker. So he's one, he's a very prominent uh, uh, psychologist. You can see the number of citations and the H index and all of that. And this is the latest book, Rationality, strongly recommended. And it's also based on a course that he's giving. And this is um, a public course right now that you can actually go and take. And I will adopt some of the uh, principles from that course in order to share that with you. Especially, I like this one, the rationality in the time of uh, coronavirus. Um, we're stepping out of the pandemic, but a year or two ago, this seemed very urgent to share with students in order to get them to feel a bit more optimistic about the world. I don't know how you're feeling right now, how you felt a year ago, but a lot of us were feeling a bit of despair. Is this, Are we ever going to come out of this pandemic? Do we have the means to fight this? How to look at this rationally? So strongly recommended. We only have a few more minutes, so I'm going to end with this video from Steven Pinker that try to summarize uh, the way to look at things rationally when it comes to media, are we getting better 
I'm getting worse, strong for me, he already said, which is there is room for optimism and it's very important to focus on the things that we can do in order to make things better rather than focus on pessimism and you know, focusing on what the media feeds us about, things are getting, getting worse. There is progress in the world. We have a role to play in making this progress happen and making the world better. There are things that we can do in order to get accurate information about the world and understand just how well we are doing. And there's all sorts of things that we can do as social psychologists to help people figure out the facts and to contribute to the world becoming better. So we'll try and do a little bit of that in this course through our task, through our uh, sessions here together. Uh, we'll visit Steven Pinker again and Hans Rosling later, but the main point is base yourself on facts, go and look up things, learn how to learn, and then you'll figure out what your role is in making the world better. So that's it for this week. Hopefully see you next week. Thank you.